Hello everyone, welcome back. So today's problem is another question taken from the Russian Physics Olympiad. This you could say is based on the chapter of EMI. Okay, so let's read what the problem is trying to say. So we have a metal bridge whose mass is M and it can slide along two horizontal conductive rails without friction. So basically these rails in which the metal in which the conductor is kept is actually conducting and there's no friction in the rails, okay? So the distance between the rails is L um, and the movement, the movement of the jumper is limited by two non-conductive rigid vertical walls W1 and W2 located at a distance d from each other. So they're talking about these two walls and they're non-conducting in nature. Then it's given that a voltage. Okay, so basically what they're saying is there is a capacitor that is charged to a voltage of U0 and another and we have a resistor R which is connected in series to the rails. Okay, and then there is another key K here. A vertical homogeneous magnetic field with induction B is turned on to the plane of the rails such that they've given us two relations. Okay, so these two relations. So the first relation is basically they're saying that the M is greater than B C squared L squared. Okay, so this is the first uh, inequality that they've given. And the second one is that and the second one is D B L is actually much greater than R C U naught. Okay, and uh, we'll discuss what these mean a bit later. So now now the now the questions are in which wo which wall will the first collision of the jumper occur? So basically they're saying that the jumper will start moving in either of the direction and the question is will it hit w1 or w2 first now the second question is what is the speed before the first collision and the third question is what is the speed before the nth collision okay it's given that all collisions of the jumper with the wall are absolutely elastic okay so the collisions are to be taken elastic and we have to comment on the speeds before collision okay so okay so that's it for the problem now uh, now let's jump into the discussion okay so firstly when we close the key what is going to happen so by closing the key we have provided the charges a path to flow so just observe the line that i'm drawing so the charges can flow along this path now and and because of the potential difference across the capacitor, the, what will happen is that the charges will start flowing in this particular direction, right? So basically what will happen is a current will start flowing uh, in the upward direction in this wire, but it flows in the downward direction as seen from above through the conductor. So now whenever we have a current carrying conductor, conductor or wire in a uniform magnetic field, the force that is applied on the conductor, we can figure it out using I L cross B. Usually we take a differential element of length DL and in integrate it for the entire conductor. But here the as the rod is just a straight line, that integral of DL will just become L and we'll get I L cross B. Okay. Once again, this L vector is along the current flow direction. So it's in the downward direction. So if you do L cross B, now B is once again into the page, the direction turns out to be towards the right. Okay. And now L, as L and B are mutually perpendicular, the magnitude is just going to be I L B. Okay, so this is what happens when we, you know, right after closing the switch, a current I will start flowing and because of that, a magnetic force of I L B acts on the conductor uh, and as a result, it will start accelerating. Okay, so we can write the F equal to M equation uh, for our conductor. So I L B is the force. This would be equal to mass times Z acceleration, uh, which we can write it as dV by dt, right? Okay, so the answer to the first question, which wall will it hit first? The answer is it'll hit the wall W2 first, right? So let's now guys, this relation that was given in the question, what this is trying to tell us is that this time, this factor RC is actually very tiny. So what this is kind of trying to tell us is that RC is small. So guys, what exactly is RC? So when you, if you guys remember uh, when we discuss a normal charging RC circuit that is connected across a battery, then you guys may be familiar with this. The, the time constant for the circuit was actually RC. And even in the case of a discharging circuit, this, the time constant is the same. Now the time constant is kind of like a measure as to how fast or how slow is the capacitor charging up. So basically the smaller the time constant, the faster the capacitor is charging. So with this statement, what they're trying to tell us is that the time it takes for the capacitor to charge up is actually pretty small. Now, the the other factor, which is dBL divided by U0, this may be related to how fast the conductor reaches the other wall. Say, for, uh, let's say, hypothetically, the conductor takes 50 seconds to reach the wall. Then in comparison to this 50 seconds, the capacitor charges up within like a within a few milliseconds or something. Okay, so this is what they're trying to tell us. The time it takes for the capacitor to charge up is tiny in comparison to the time it takes for the conductor to uh, reach the walls basically right okay so the basic assumption will be that before the conductor reaches any of the walls the capacitor would already be charged fully okay meaning there won't be any current in the circuit after that okay so if we first uh, discuss that okay so this is the first equation and second we discuss that 
the capacitor charges up pretty quickly okay so now the third part of the discussion is that when does the charging stop right and the answer to that is we have to just think about when does the current in the circuit become zero so basically what causes the flow of charges so what is the driver of current and the answer is potential difference right we in our circuit we want some potential difference otherwise there won't be any current so so i equal to zero is equivalent to saying that the emf across the loop is zero Okay, so let's say after some time, my conductor is somewhere over here. And uh, now obviously, uh, as it has been accelerating for some time, it would have obviously gained some velocity. Okay, and let's say its speed is V. So guys, whenever we have a moving conductor in a uniform magnetic field, you guys may be familiar with this result. There is going to be a motional EMF that develops across the ends of this conductor, uh, whose magnitude is actually VBL, right? In this particular case, it turns out to be VBL, where L is the length of the rod. So now how do we decide the polarity? So for the polarity, we'll just see what's the Lorentz force acting on a positive charge inside the conductor so basically we pick up a positive charge and observe the direction of v cross b so v is towards the right b is into the page so v cross b is in the upward direction meaning the positive charges will be pushed in the upward direction or the electrons will actually move in the downward direction so so the induced emf we can depict as a battery whose positive polarity opens upwards right so this is my e induced so our two emf sources are basically e in you could say and the capacitor right Okay, so now uh, obviously guys, the capacitor is being discharged. I'm just gonna assume for a second that uh, when the current in the circuit becomes zero, I'm gonna assume the charge on the positive plate of the capacitor is plus Q. And uh, at that instant, I'm gonna say that the velocity of my conductor is V1. So let's call it V1. So if you observe something guys, after this instant, the current becomes zero. Current in the circuit becomes zero. And if the current in the circuit is zero, then what that means is the uh, there won't be any magnetic force acting on the conductor, meaning the V1 will actually remain constant till it hits the wall, right? So V1, in other words, is also the speed with which the conductor hits the wall. So all we so basically we have to find out V1. Now we'll just equate the EMFs. So okay, so the potential rise across the capacitor is equal to Q by C, and there is a potential drop of E in when we move through our conductor. So these two have to be equal in magnitude. So basically we can say Q by C, which is the voltage of the capacitor, should be equal to the potential difference across the conductor, which is VBL. When this happens, the current in the circuit becomes zero. Okay, so I'm going to be calling this as V1. So basically, if we can find out what's the charge on the capacitor right now, then I can find out V1, right? So for that, we'll use our F equal to MA equation. So if I have current, how can I find charge? So I'll just integrate it, right? So basically, I can take this DT and send it to the other side. So one side becomes M dV and the right hand side becomes LB multiplied by I dT. So now I can integrate this expression uh, at t equal to zero state, the speed of the conductor was zero, we'll integrate till the time the velocity reaches the value of V1. So from here, we get MV1 equals LB multiplied by integral of I dT. Now as this integral of I dT is obviously a positive term, right? Because I is a scalar, dt is a scalar. If you multiply two positive things, it's going to be a positive quantity. So what does integral of I dt physically signify? So let's try to understand that. So once again, guys, I is the current, current through the circuit at any instant, right? So if you take that current and if you multiply it with dt, what we get is the charge that flows away from the positive plate of the capacitor. So for a second, if I say dq equals I dt, so what happens is that in the next dt seconds, dq charge will leave the positive plate of the capacitor. So if I keep integrating that i dt from 0 to t, what that becomes is delta q, where this delta q is the charge that flows away from the positive plate. Okay, so and once again, guys, you have to make sure that this is a positive quantity, right? So what is the magnitude of charge that flowed away from the positive plate? So initially, the capacitor was had a voltage of u0. So the charge on the positive plate was c u0 right and finally it is q now q is obviously less than cu naught so the magnitude of charge that flowed away is so we can say mv1 equals lb times cu naught minus q okay as cu naught is greater than q the delta q is going to be cu naught minus q okay okay so from here we can figure out the value of q it turns out to be this particular value okay and now we can just plug it back into our first equation okay and once we solve for it we'll get this expression for v1 
okay so this is the velocity with which the conductor first hits the wall two so once it reaches v1 there won't be any current and this will just move with a uniform velocity till it collides with the wall so next action happens when it actually collides with the wall till then nothing much is going to happen okay so what happens so now let's talk about what happens when the conductor actually collides with the wall so at this instant the charge on the capacitor is q I'm just going to call it Q1 because we call the velocity as V1, right? So now what happens is that the V1 velocity will now be reversed. Okay. And what does this V1 reversing do exactly? If you guys remember the, the direction, the polarity of induced EMF, we decided using V cross B, right? So if we reverse the direction of V, we reverse the direction of V cross B. So initially it uh, the positive polarity was up, upwards. Now the positive polarity will be downwards. So basically what will happen is that now the polarity of VBL is going to be now downwards. Okay, so uh, now because once again, potential difference is set up, there will be current flow once again. But here, if you observe the current, uh, the direction of current is exactly the same as before, right? So the current through the conductor is still in the downward direction. Okay, and if you guys having uh, are having a doubt with the current flow direction, then we can just draw in a simple equivalent circuit, right? So so I'm going to just draw a battery with the EMF of VBL representing the representing the motional EMF. Okay. And then we have a resistor and our capacitor, right? So this is my effective uh, circuit. So now the thing is, guys, the positive, the positive plate of my battery is actually attached to the negative plate of the capacitor. Okay. So at the initial instant, this is going to be my negative plate and this is going to be my positive plate. Okay. Now all you have to do is apply V equal to IR1s and you can see that the capacitor the current is going to be in the clockwise sense, okay? So basically in the conductor, it will be in the downward direction, right? If it's in the downward direction, you guys can figure out IBL, okay? So the current in through the conductor is in the downward direction. So once again, if we do IL cross B, it turns out to be towards the right. So now the conductor is going to get decelerated. Uh, so for, now for this circuit, guys, what is the stopping condition? So what will happen is that current current will flow right current will start flowing and it will start discharging the capacitor but there's a slight difference in this case so finally the initial the plate which was negative initial in in terms of potential now becomes positive and the other plate becomes negative so this vbl voltage rise should be opposed by a q by c decrease across the capacitor but that will only happen when if this minus plate becomes a plus plate, right? So in the initial situation, we assume the charge of Q1. In the final stage, let's just assume Q2, okay? And, and the final velocity at which current becomes zero, once again is, let's say, V2. So basically what will happen is the conductor will now move for some distance. And when its speed becomes V2 and the capacitor charge becomes Q2 and the polarity reverses, the current once again becomes zero. Okay, so now let's write down our equation. So first we can write down the KVL equation in this loop. So we can say V2BL equals Q2 divided by C. So this is my first relation, right? Okay, and the second relation will obviously come from F equal to MA. But here there's a slight difference. So mass times the acceleration, this would be equal to minus ILB. Why? Because the rod is being decelerated now, right? So here M delta V turns out to be minus LB times integral of IDT. Now integral of IDT, um, once again, is a positive quantity. So I'm just going to write it as delta Q. Okay, guys. So now the thing is you can either set up uh, the limits properly or you can just use logic. So I know that the final velocity is going to be smaller because the rod is being decelerated. So the left hand side, I'm deliberately making it positive. So it'll be M times V1 minus V2, right? And um, as the left hand side is positive, the right hand side should be positive as well. So this would be LB multiplied by mod of delta Q. So now all I have to do is see how much charge flowed for this time, uh, during this time, okay? And for that, all you have to do is just observe one plate, any one of the plate, okay? Okay, so I'm just gonna observe the positive plate. So initially, the positive plate had a charge of Q1. And finally, it has a charge of minus Q2. Okay, so what exactly happened? So, so we can think of this in steps. So initially, let's say Q1 charge flowed away from the capacitor plate. So what is that charge left? Zero. And then I'm going to say another charge of plus Q2 flowed away from the positive plate, leaving a deficiency of minus Q2. So initially Q1 flowed away and the charge was zero. And now additional Q2 flowed away. And now there is a deficiency of Q2 which is minus Q2, right? So what is the total charge that flowed away from the plus plate? Q1 plus Q2, okay? And on the other side, uh, 
plus q1 comes right and this became this becomes zero and then another plus q2 comes and it becomes plus q2 right so the total charge that flowed during this time is q1 plus q2 so the left hand side so the left hand side is m v1 minus v2 the right hand side becomes lb multiplied by q1 plus q2 okay so now guys before we jump into any further solving let's just observe what's happening so let's just uh, think of it a little bit into the future so what will happen after this so v2 will become constant it will go hit the other wall and then again the same process will repeat right again the same process will repeat the capacitor's polarity will be finally reversed once again and then there will be another charge of q3 so basically we are going to do the same process again and again and again for the upcoming iterations right so what i can do is i can just i can just modify this equation to comment on the nth terms okay so so if i just look uh, and observe the pattern in the nth collision what will happen is the the this term v1 minus v2 this will be symmetrically vn minus 1 minus vn right and the right hand side would be lb multiplied by qn plus qn minus 1 okay and uh, this equation is very simple it's just that it's it's just telling us vn bl would be just qn over c okay so this is quite straightforward okay so now let's try to solve for vn so if you further solve it vn minus 1 minus vn and the right hand side for qn i'm going to write cbl into vn and qn minus 1 would be cvn minus 1 bl right so so i can take the cbl outside and this becomes l square b square c times vn plus vn minus 1 so now let's bring vn minus 1 to one side and vn to the other and after separating vn and vn minus 1 we get uh, this as my expression right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write this constant thing as k and multiply it with vn minus 1 right so if you observe this relation if i instead of n if i put n minus 1 the right hand side becomes n minus 2 right and i can just keep continuing it again and again and again now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take vn minus 1 and put it over here so what happens is it becomes k squared times vn minus 2 and if you do the same for vn minus 2 it becomes k cube times vn minus 3 and if you keep repeating that because i'm going to try to bring it in terms of v1 right the final term becomes k to the power something multiplied by v1 so you can just observe these uh, individual terms so if you observe here it is 2 plus n minus 2 so that turns out to be n 3 plus n minus 3 that turns out to be n 1 plus n minus 1 that turns out to be n so here it'll be n minus 1 right okay so now we already have the value of v1 figured out and we'll just substitute the k back and raise it to the power of n minus 1 so if you observe this thing will actually multiply up with the denominator and the final term just becomes this particular value okay so just for a consistency check we can substitute the value of n as 1 and uh, this term would just become 1 and we'll get the same thing that we figured out earlier right okay so that was it for this question um, if you guys have any doubts you can just comment on below and yeah that's about it guys uh, do like share and subscribe if you enjoy the video and that's it thanks for watching